This video is brought to you by SailRight. Visit SailRight.com for all your project supplies, tools, and instructions. In this video, we're going to show you how to reupholster the backrest for this pontoon bench seat. In separate videos, we show how to do the seat, the side arms, and the base. If you'd like to see videos for that, check out the links in the description below. Hi, I'm Eric Grant with SailRight. Today we're going to show you how to reupholster this pontoon seat. A lot of pontoons have seats very similar to this one. This one's in very bad shape, so we're going to show you how to redo it. This is what the pontoon seat looked like before we did our reupholstery job. And this is what the pontoon seat looks like after we did the reupholstery job to every piece. We'll be walking you through every single step to reupholster this backrest on this pontoon bench. In this video, we'll be using a vinyl fabric called Eversoft, which is made for indoor and outdoor applications. At the end of this video, we'll have a materials and tools list, and in that materials list, we're going to show you the exact quantities we used to build this backrest. Let's get started. The first step is to remove the old vinyl fabric. So it's stapled along the bottom here, and there is a seam here that we're gonna basically rip the stitches out so that we can separate that and hopefully pull this cover off. We can rip a few more stitches up here as well. The fabric pole that is in here seems to still be attached, at least on the ends. On the middle, it seems to be loose. Probably just the staples came free. So what I'm gonna do is cut across here, but I'm gonna leave that end totally intact so I can see how it was built. Okay, the foam is covered in a plastic. It's pretty thick plastic. Actually, if you hear that, this is what it would sound like when you sit on it. A silk film is probably a better plastic for this, though this is a little bit thicker. But the reason it's saturated with water, you can't tell, but it is super heavy. Um, once we get this off, we hope that the boards will dry out. So I'm gonna take this plastic off. It appears the only thing holding this together was the actual vinyl fabric. It fell apart as soon as we <laughs> took the vinyl and the plastic off. This wood is completely saturated with water and it fell apart, obviously, as you could see earlier. But we had a second one and we took it apart probably uh, three days ago and reassembled it. And it's actually very dry. So this is a marine plywood, so it did dry out and we were able to rebuild it, and it's not too bad. I would probably replace the wood if I were doing it myself, but uh, the owner of this boat just said reuse the wood again. So we're gonna reuse this frame and show you how to rebuild it. When this one dries out, we'll rebuild it in the same manner. If your frame didn't fall apart, um, you're, you're in good shape, but ours fell apart as this one did, and so what we did is we marked it A, B, on the back, we marked C, we marked up, we marked lower, mid, top, very top. That way we knew exactly how it was to be rebuilt after it dried out. And next, we'll cut the foam to size and we'll also show you how to make a bolster out of square foam. After the cover is removed, one of the first steps is to cut the new foam. This foam's in bad shape, has holes in it, smells bad. Uh, we're gonna make new foam for it. So the thickness of this foam is three inches, and then we measure the length of this foam. Now, it will compress slightly when the cover is put on it. So we always wanna consider that, and we actually cut the foam slightly bigger. What I'll probably do is add a quarter inch to all sides slightly so that it, it'll compress down. So a quarter inch here, quarter inch here, quarter inch here, and a quarter inch down there. So we s measured it, and we're just striking lines so that we can cut the foam to size. As, as you can see here, we have just a little bit of extra foam, about a quarter inch, all around the perimeter. The Cerite blade foam saw works great for cutting high density, medium density, low density foams. It has a flat pad that makes your cut almost perfectly 90 degrees and rollers on the bottom side so it rolls effortlessly on a tabletop. Now 
Now you could use an electric kitchen knife for Thanksgiving. The cut's not as good, but it does work for medium density foams. It doesn't work as well for high density. So let's compare the cuts. So this is the cut with the blade foam saw. And that cut's not too bad. A little bit wavy, but it's still gonna work great. So this piece was glued onto here, and that's for good reason. Now we already pulled it off. Uh, we need to take measurements of it. To make our rounded bolster, we're gonna use a square piece of foam and with that square piece of foam, we're going to take one inch and we're going to wrap it around it to give it a curved look. Now, before we wrap it, we're going to cut out some of the foam at the corners and we'll be showing you how to do that. But in able to do this, we need to take measurements to calculate for the one inch foam that we're going to add. So when I look down the foam, I can see that if I put a mark there, that's going to be one inch. If I look here, I don't want to look to measure at the compressed section. I want to look and see where the highest point of the foam is, right there. And that is one inch there because it's higher over here than it is here. And then if I look down this side, right there. So if I measure from this, I get four and a half inches. And if I measure the height, I'm a little bit under four, but I'm going to go with four inches. So I'm going to cut a four inch thick foam, four and a half inches wide, and that'll be my block. Now look over here. We have a little flap of fabric that is basically the top of my backrest. All we have to do for that, so imagine this is our block if I had it cut right, is I would run this one inch down to create that. Here's a look ahead at the finished bolster foam as we glue it to this pontoon's backrest cushion seat. So this is my four inch thick foam. I'm measuring at four and a half. I'll put a few marks and strike a line. So we're using the blade foam saw and it has a flat base with rollers on the bottom which will give us an almost perfect uh, 90 degree cut on the foam. I am placing marks so that I can hopefully more consistently cut the corners. And I am only taking off basically a random amount um, that I'm determining uh, for the roundness that I want. Um, I suppose if you wanted to make it more of a rounded look, you take off a little bit more of the corners. Making sure my foam is straight because it's a foam never sits very straight. Perfect. So there's one corner. I'll do the same thing to this one. Now you can take this base off, which I think is helpful for this kind of stuff. So I'm going to just loosen the screw. And then I find it better to take the base off by putting it on the floor and then with your shoes on so you don't get cut, just wiggle it. The base comes right off. Now if you had a second helper, you wouldn't have to use a weight like this. I'm going to put the weight close to the end because the end seems to vibrate more than anything when you start. So as you can see, what I'm trying to do is just stay on my black lines. And I can move this weight down now that it started. If you don't have a professional foam cutter like the Serite Blade Foam Saw, you can use an electric kitchen knife, as long as your foam is not a high density foam. It does work, but not nearly as well as the Serite Blade Foam Saw. Now what we have here is a spaghetti lid off of a glass jar that we punched holes in with, a screw. 
And if you don't have a saw like this, you, this is a, a sharp edge, you can actually use this and sculpt the foam. And we have a whole video on how to do this, but you'll notice right away, look at that edge. So you can use something like this if you'd like. Now I'm taking a soft tape measure and just measuring down the edge of the table and down here. Remember we have to have extra foam, so we're going to cut a piece of foam 14 inches. We'll have too much, but I'd rather have too much than too little. You can actually cut one inch foam pretty easily with scissors if you'd like. And the edge isn't bad. But to make fast work of it, I'm going to use the Sayrite blade foam saw. We're going to use foam lock spray adhesive and we're going to spray both sur surfaces. This contoured bolster is being made for the top of a backrest on a pontoon boat. So we are using a medium density, medium firmness foam for the block and a medium density, soft firmness foam for the one inch topper. Okay, you have to wait for the glue to tack up, which it has, and uh, a simple way to do this is to actually do it like this. Okay, so that's on there. Now I didn't press down hard yet. Uh, I have to roll it um, because we're trying to roll it over the top, and this kind of Unfortunately, you're going to get your hands a little bit sticky. The bottom side doesn't have any glue on it. So I'm going to press down a little bit just to make sure that it brings this foam with it. And then from the middle position, I'm going to start rolling. Applying pressure as I roll. Making sure everything's staying glued together. Good. And then roll again. Now I don't have to worry about touching the glue. I do often get glue on my fingers and it does take a pretty aggressive uh, soap to get it off or a solvent. Um, try to avoid that. You may want to wear gloves. If it looks like you've glued um, a little bit crooked here, like this one doesn't look as, as compressed, I can peel it up if I get to it right away and compress it a little bit more. So I'm going to look down the table, make sure it's straight on there, and see if it looks like it's pretty consistently rolled. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Looks like it needs to be come down here a little bit. So what foam did we use to make this? We used a one inch soft, medium density foam for the roll, and we used a medium density foam for our block underneath. Uh, and it's very soft and very rounded. This approach works great. To give the backrest a little bit of style, we're gonna sew channeling into the maroon fabric. you notice this maroon piece uh, goes all the way from the front here. To turn it around so you can see it. From the front here, all the way to the back. Okay, and then this is a boxing piece down here that we'll have to sew on. Um, but right now we're gonna concentrate on making this maroon piece, and we're gonna stick with the same color in a different vinyl, of course. We're going to install channeling in our piece. So every two inches, we're gonna have a stitch in a sew foam. We think that'll make the cushion look a lot better. So this one measures four inches from here to here. We always wanna make our uh, channeling piece bigger. So we're probably gonna go six inches and we're also gonna add extra for the length because sometimes they can shrink up. Eversoft vinyl is a four-way stretch you notice here along the width it stretches, obviously along the bias it stretches, but also along the length it stretches. So it takes the shape of your project beautifully. I love working with Eversoft material available from Sailrite. The length of our panel, just the top is 59 and a half inches, so I'm gonna cut a length that's 80 inches and six inches, and I'm gonna mark it on the back side of the fabric. 
The clear acrylic ruler is six inches wide, so this makes it easy to mark it along the length. Again, we need 80 inches. Okay, we've already cut our half inch sew foam to size. Obviously, it's oversized in the fabric. That makes it easier to apply the fabric. The side with the scrim, the fabric backing, is facing down and the foam side is facing up. We want to put the glue on the foam side. And obviously our vinyl fabric is facing wrong side down. I'm sorry, wrong side up. So we want to spray it with, again, the foam lock spray adhesive on both surfaces for a permanent bond. Okay, when the glue becomes tacky, you can uh, adhere it down and the glue is definitely tacky. This is why we make the sew foam larger, because I don't have to be very precise this way. I just have to make sure the fabric is laying nice and flat with no bubbles in it like there is here. And we have plenty of fabric. Remember we made extra fabric and extra sew foam. Now I'll move the paper and I'll smooth it out even more. Now cutting through foam that has a glue on it can gum up your scissors. Using a dry silicone lubricant or McLube, which is what we're going to use on your scissors, can help prevent that glue from becoming bonded to your scissors and ruining them, or making you have to clean them, I should say. So we're going to just trim it to size. Okay, so we're going to take our assembly and we're going to flip it over, and we're going to draw our channeling lines, which will make it easier for sewing. And we've decided to, to draw them um, two inches down apart. So we're going to start here close to the end because um, we don't really know where the end is. Now we want to keep these lines going uh, perpendicular with the edge. So once you draw one line, hopefully it's perpendicular. Yep, it is. So we use a clear acrylic ruler and we can see right where the line is and we can easily mark every two inches. We were using a honkin' big marker. It's better to use one of these fine tip markers. Your lines are more consistent, easier to tell where you're gonna sew, and it doesn't make as much black on your, fat, on your project. Okay, we, we're gonna sew from the back side, and you want to make sure that you check your stitch tension, like this is on some scrap fabric here, to make sure that your knot's pulled up well and uh, that everything looks good. And you definitely want a full bobbin. We're going to sew this at approximately six millimeters. We're not going to do any reversing, um, mainly because we're going to be cutting this down to size, but you want to try to stay on top of your line. Reversing is not a bad idea, but you have to make sure that it's in the seam allowance area. You'd never want to see it in the final product. Now what you can do is you can cut your thread or you can just leave your thread attached and come back up to the top. That way you don't have to hold on to your trailers. Oh, I should have checked to see what my stitch looked like on this, the original. I did not do that, so let's do that now. We already tested the tension in some scrap, but it's always a good idea to check it in the final piece. Okay, so see, there's a little bit of the knot exposed here. So we want, to, we want more upper tension because this is the bottom side. This is going to be acceptable, but it's not what I want. So I'm going to increase the upper tension by one full revolution and we'll check it again. We're going to cut the thread since we're checking tension. A better. I'm going to go a little bit more, half turn more. I think I'll be happy now. So I'm going to continue sewing. So again, what do we want to do to make this process fast is um, not cut our thread. So we'll sew. And we'll lift our foot rotate our balance wheel a little bit to get our thread to come out nicely and move up to the next stitch and sew.
Here's a little pro tip. When you lift your foot, if the take-up arm, if you roll the balance wheel so the take-up's arm all the way up without coming down, then lift your presser foot, your thread will always be released so you can easily move to the next stitch. So that's a little pro tip. And then when your fabric gets to be a little bit bulky like ours is starting to become, then we'll switch and go to the other side. So let's do this one more time. Okay, so now we're gonna take this out and we're gonna start from the other end since we have all this bulk sewn in here, but it's looking really good. So now we'll come over here and start here. When you're done sewing the channeling, you will need to cut the tail ends of the thread on both the top side and the bottom side. Our channeling is done. Now it's time to glue some foam onto the frame. On the sides here, we don't want to just feel the board, so we're going to put a, a half inch sew foam on it. The sew foam has a fabric backing on one side, that's so you can sew channeling, and just foam on the other. We're going to spray on the fabric backing side and also on the wood. Okay, when the glue is tacky, it's time to apply the uh, half inch sew foam. And I'm just going to randomly put it down here. Now I am going to have an edge down at the bottom um, so that it wraps a little bit down the around the bottom so that our vinyl doesn't get cut by the sharp edges of the uh, board. We'll do this to both sides. We're also going to allow some foam to wrap around the back side. Not very much, just enough to protect the vinyl. Then here along the front, we're gonna trim it flush, right with the wood. On this front side, this is where the uh, actual foam will be placed, so there's no reason to leave any excess. That's why we're trimming it right alongside of the wooden structure. We don't need all this at the bottom, so again, just a little bit overhanging. Okay, we're using our foam lock spray adhesive. We're gonna glue this bolster to the frame, so we're gonna put glue on both surfaces. When installing the vinyl fabric over the bolster, it could move around. That's why we glue it to the frame. After a few minutes, the uh, glue is tacky. It's now time to apply the bolster to the back or the top of our pontoon seat backrest. A second person can help in this task because once the foam touches the glue, it doesn't like to let go. Um, if you catch it right away and peel it up, yeah, you'll probably be fine, but you need to try to get it on there accurately the first time. So now we're going to roll it up, and now we're going to pull the top to the edge. You do have a brief window to work with the uh, glue before it sets permanently. More glue. We're also putting the glue on this edge of this foam up here. We're just going to put sew foam from here to here. This will give it a nice look. It's, the rail comes here and is screwed into here, but this will make it so it doesn't have a sharp edge. Applying the uh, half inch sew foam to this back edge will ensure that when the vinyl wraps around the back side, you will not have a sharp edge from the board. If we're over the top, we can trim it. Notice that we're doing this with two strips. We're saving material by not throwing away our small pieces of scrap. The joint in the middle, as we butt it up, will not be visible. Now you can cut it with an electric kitchen knife or the blade foam saw or even a pair of scissors here uh, so that it's flush with the top edge of your bolster. We're just going to shape this a little bit. This is the back edge, so it's probably not a big deal. But if you're off, this definitely uh, helps to shape things. The lid with holes, punched with a screw. I'm going to put some dry silicone lubricant on our blade. But this is actually McLube, which is better than that. And uh, Sarah sells it. 
This will make the foam go across the blade nicely and it also cleans up that glue residue. So I want a little bit of extra foam here, but this is still too much. So I'm going to use this to carve it off. Okay, so we have some extra foam here. And, and the idea is here, there's a half inch foam and it doesn't compress much at all because it's running into that hard board. But here, there is no hard board, so it will compress. And even though it's a little bit taller than this, this is, it'll compress down and be even when you put the vinyl cover on. Next up, patterning our four-way stretch vinyl fabric. So we've laid this uh, bottom piece on top and it is flush with this foam on this side and also the other side. Uh, this will compress. Watch this. This will compress. This will not because it's running into a board. This will easily compress. It's a softer foam. So we, it, it'll, don't worry about the fact that there's a gap here. This, this is going to come down nicely. So now we have a maroon strip that goes in the middle of this and that maroon strip is four inches wide. So what I'm, I've cut some scrap fabric to four inches and it's a perfect rectangle. So I want to lay that on the location where that maroon strip will go because we don't need to pattern for that. But we do need the lines. So I'm going to trace the lines that are right alongside of this because they're not straight up and down. They actually are angled slightly. So we need that, those angles. Okay, so it, I know you'd probably think, oh, it's just going to be straight up and down like that, but notice it's not. Now, once that's done, I'm going to spray this with our foam lock again, just so I can get the pattern material to stick to this. Not much glue, just enough to keep everything in place on these ends. Let that tack up. So we have some Duraskrim pattern material and the, this edge at the bottom is, is straight. So I'm going to lay it on there so that it's flush with the tabletop and hopefully our uh, glue will hold it in place so that we can pattern. Then I'm going to cut away some of this excess so it's not in my way. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pattern directly on top of these lines, not adding any seam allowance for this area. We want it to be compressed. We're using a four-way stretch vinyl, so it'll compress nicely. And then here, I don't want any seam allowance here, so I'm going to go right along the edge of my foam. Following its shape. Now here, we want this to be curved. We do not want a 90 degree turn here. Okay, we want this to, if we leave this here, there's gonna be excess fabric. So I'm gonna create a gentle curve here. Like that. Here, 90 degrees is fine because we're just sewing fabric onto this bottom edge. Now I'm gonna, now, I, what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to trace on the foam, but I'm going to, going to expand it out a half inch. So I'm going to put an arrow here, and we are going to say plus one half inch. Okay. The reason that we're doing that is that uh, this is just three inches, and then there's a solid board down here, and that solid board does not compress. This will compress slightly, but not enough. So when I take, if I were to cut it right on that line and not add a half inch, I'm basically expecting this to compress one inch. It's not going to compress one inch. That's why we add a half inch right there. So this is going to continue on. I want to cut my um, vinyl so that it's longer. And we want about three extra inches. So that's a little bit less than three, but that'll, that'll do it. So I'm going to cut my actual plate this size all the way down to here. Okay, so now this is this is the top of my backrest. So I'm going to label it top, and this is the top. 
here if you consider that that's the top of the backrest. So while this is on here, let's put the on where the piping goes. The piping is going to come down here and basically disappear into this maroon strip. So I'm going to put an arrow here and put pipe. And it's going to go all the way around and it's going to disappear into here. So I want my piping uh, to basically stop here. So I'll put pipe here and an arrow that way indicating that it goes on like that. So we know that no piping goes here. Okay, so that's a, a good thing to do while you're patterning so that you don't get confused and sew your piping on accidentally like this and have no piping here. We want piping to go like that. Now we can use this as our pattern. So we have two plates. Well, three really. We have the maroon strip. We have this plate that comes down and wraps around to the backer board. And then we have this plate that, co that jo is joined together to the maroon plate that comes down and goes all the way up over this side and all the way to the back. So we need measurements for those to know how to cut those. Those are perfect rectangles for us. So I'm going to measure from the uh, maroon strip, and I'm not going to add any seam allowance because I'm going to make these long, and come down the side, and 14 inches should be quite sufficient. So we're going to cut one 14 inches. Then this one's on, this one's going to be um, six inches, uh, but in the end it'll be four inches. I'm going to make a six-inch channeling strip, and then I'm going to cut it down to uh, so that it equals four inches after it's sewn. We'll show that later on. This one we're going to join or come down to the joint. We're going to go around the back side and come up the back side. And we have about 33 inches should be sufficient. And that also would include for the seam allowance for this, because 33 inches is definitely enough. So 14 inch plate here, 33 inch plate here, and then we need it the uh, length of our foam. So the length of our foam here for both this piece and this piece is 59 and a quarter. Now we want to make these plates smaller because it'll compress quite a bit here, and we're also using a four way stretch vinyl. So I'm going to go one inch smaller. So 59 and a quarter equals 58 and a quarter. So my plates, both plates, 58 and a quarter by 14 inches and 58 and a quarter by 33 inches. So we're using a four-way stretch vinyl. It stretches along the width of the fabric beautifully. It stretches uh, along the length of the fabric beautifully and obviously along the bias as all vinyls do. If you're using a vinyl fabric that is not a four-way stretch vinyl, this is called Eversoft, you will not want to shrink it down one inch like we are here. A four-way stretch vinyl looks great if it's actually stretched tightly over the foam, as you can see we are doing here. But if you're using a non-four-way stretch marine vinyl, it will not stretch as well. So in those cases, it should be cut to match the foam size. Seam allowance will reduce it by almost an inch, but that should make it look good in the end by compressing the foam slightly. Not a bad idea to write this all down, especially if you have several backrests to do for your pontoon boat. More than likely you do. So we've wrote down all of our measurements so we can duplicate it again. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is add that half inch that we talked about. So I'm going to use the clear acrylic ruler and uh, strike a line that's a half inch from that edge. Now we can simply trace around the rest of it. Now at the bottom edge here, I'm not going to worry about this excess because it wraps around, so I'm not going to cut it off and I'm not going to tra trace it. So this is the top, this is the top, this is our piping starting here and the piping stopping here so I'm going to transfer that line to this and I'll make an arrow going that way, an arrow going that way with a P. Now we have to make a copy of these and they need to be mirrored which means that we flip them and pattern again. This copy will be for the opposite end. There we go. 
So we'll trace around those and cut them out again. Now I didn't trace around it. All I'm doing is holding the pattern in place steadily and cutting around it. It's your choice. I'll transfer those lines for the piping. You'll also need to cut out the two plates. We did not show that. There is a particular order that this must be sewn in. First off, we need to sew the piping onto these pieces, that one as well, and then we need to sew it onto this plate. Then we need to sew this onto this plate. After that's done, so these two pieces will be complete, we will sew a um, fabric pole onto this plate. We will sew this onto this plate. Then the final step is to sew this onto this plate. This way the piping and the edges will go all inside everything and they won't be sticking out. Sound confusing? Don't worry. Each chapter will lead you in the correct order that you need to go. Next up, making piping. For this seat back cushion, we don't need a lot of uh, piping for this uh, pontoon boat. Uh, we're cutting the strip of fabric that's going to make our piping to an inch and a half in width using the clear acrylic ruler. And this will give us a flange when it's done that equals a half inch, which is the same as our seam allowance, which is what we want. Now we probably can get it all done with one strip, but I do want to show how you would join the piping together because you may have more piping in your application. So I'm going to cut a second strip that we'll use and join it onto this, even though it's probably too much uh, fabric. If you're reupholstering an entire pontoon, it is likely that you'll yep. have many backrests and many cushions to make, so why not make all your piping at once? So here's the 45 degree on our clear acrylic ruler, so I'm going to lay it across one of the edges of the fabric. Then I'm going to pull the fabric out to the end so that I can cut a 45 degree on that end. I can pull this one back like that. So I'm going to strike a line here with our two strips that we need to join together, and then I'm going to cut it at that line. So now face this one up, so the outside surface is facing up, and then this one gets faced uh, down, and uh, it gets put 90 degrees to the second one, like that. And then what we do is we sew from here to here, right across there, to join these two together. When I sew strips of, of uh, piping together, I like to do my stitch very small, so that, especially on vinyl applications, so about three millimeters. No need to do reversing. Uh, all we're doing is just joining the two together. But this makes it possible for us. And see, see how it's a little bit off? I mean, it's probably because I wasn't very precise. That's not a big deal, because when it gets folded with the piping on the inside, uh, those edges basically be sandwiched like this, and you'll still be able to follow the edges quite nicely. Okay, this is a foam piping that's pretty rigid, actually, but it's not too uncomfortable, and it doesn't soak up any water at all. Um, we're going to fold it to the inside. This is a 5 seconds inch piping, and we have a quarter inch uh, cording foot for the fabricator installed on this sewing machine. So all I'm going to do is keep a stitch uh, right up against the piping and feed the piping in the tunnel. I'm going to change the stitch length down to approximately 6 millimeters. Now all I do is fold the fabric and hopefully have it come fairly close to matching up with the other side of the fabric. If it's slightly off, it's not a big deal, but you want to try to be as consistent as you possibly can. Now, why did we cut straight cut piping instead of uh, bias cut piping? Well, for one, we're using Eversoft vinyl, which is a four-way stretch vinyl, so it goes around corners beautifully. But for all of my vinyl applications, I never cut bias cut piping for those because I can cut slits in the vinyl and it actually goes around corners nicely. If you cut it on the bias, it's just a little bit more labor intensive. 
Now I'm coming close to this uh, seam, so what I'll do is I'll splay it so it's nice and flat here, and that way it won't be as pronounced. So see how it's flat? And then I'll fold it over and sew it. So if you take a look at this, this isn't going to be visible, it's going to be on the inside of the cushion, but take a look at that uh, uh, piping uh, joint or seam. It looks great. That's quite acceptable to have every time you need to join fabric together. Next we're going to concentrate on the top portion which covers the bolster foam. So our piping uh, begins here and here. So I'm going to take that line that we struck on the fabric and transfer it to the vinyl side with a pencil on both pieces. To sew this piping on, you'll need a cording foot installed on the Sayrite Fabricator sewing machine. Okay, so we want piping to be sewn on like this. There are the arrows. No piping here. Okay, so there's our line. So I'm going to leave a little tail hanging down here, which will probably be chopped off later on, but I'm going to start sewing basically right at that line. We think that's the dead stop. I'm going to release my um, presser foot lock mechanism in the back and use my knee lift for this, the fabricator sewing machine. Okay, so we're going to follow that curve. We have the cording foot installed. I'm going to put a couple stitches in here doing a little bit of reversing, not much. Okay, so now I have to go around this corner, so I'm going to cut a few little slits in the flange. That will allow the piping to take that curve nicely, and then I'm going to sew. Might as well put a few slits in this area. This will allow it to expand. So we get a beautiful piece. Okay, now I wouldn't think we, yeah, we want piping to go all the way to here. Cut a few little slits in this again, going around another curve. And I'm going to do a little bit of reversing here. Okay, we're going to cut this a little bit long, like that. And there's our first piece. Now we'll duplicate that with this, except for in this situation we have to sew from the other end. So piping here stops there at our mark, which we've already put on this side, starting here. Same process. There's our stop point. We'll put a little mark on the piping there and we'll also transfer it here. Okay. My 33 inch side is vertical. My long side is horizontal. So I want this to go on like this. Okay. So this is my long side or length of my cushion. I want to start sewing not at this end where the piping starts, but where the piping stops. If you look at the back side, there's our mark. So we want this to be 
approximately a half inch from the edge of the fabric, this edge of the fabric, right like that. And this should be almost flush in line. So it's at this juncture, right at that mark, that I'm going to start sewing. And I have my cording foot installed. So basically right here, I'm going to have to create a, a, a sharp turn. So I'm going to do a little bit of reversing there. Bury my needle at that basically that stop point. Lift my presser foot and start uh, rolling the assembly around so I can make this sharp turn. I've already cut slits into this ar around the perimeter, which is going to help it to go around uh, curves well. Somehow we missed the uh, clip, or it didn't get filmed, when we cut the slits into that fabric assembly that the piping was sewn to. If you take a look at that fabric, in other words, the boxing piece that we're sewing onto the plate, you can see that there are slits everywhere that the fabric wanted to uh, basically cause a wrinkle, and those slits allow the fabric to uh, relax. So we didn't show it, but we cut slits at every wrinkle allowing the fabric to relax at those points. See all these slits are allowing it just to kind of relax at the curves. I didn't don't need slits at straightaways, but curves definitely help. Turn it right side out and inspect to see if I need to get any stitching closer to the piping. No, that looks pretty good. It's real good. Now we'll do the same thing to the other end. So there's my stop point. There's where it sews off. So my stop point goes to this corner. This is the 33 inch side. This is the length. So we're going to sew it on down this side, just like this. Okay, you notice though you can't sew this direction, so we have to sew with this upside down. So I'm going to flip everything. Okay, I'm going to put that, the, the mark has already been transferred there. Now this piping is a little bit loose from this edge, so I'm going to basically try to hold it in position here. So see my little red mark here? I don't know if you can see it, but it's right there. So I'm going to do a little reversing here. Just cut this excess thread out of the way. And we'll start sewing in the same way that we did the other side, except for with the boxing on the underside. Since this process is done exactly in the same way we already showed with the other side, we are going to move ahead. Oh, when sewing on the plate like this, I didn't cut any slits in it, but you may want to at curves. It may help the fabric to take the curve better. Let's move on. Okay, that vinyl piece for the bolster is done. Now we're going to concentrate on the lower piece, the piece that goes underneath the maroon piece. This one's done. Now we concentrate on this one. This is the top, so outside surfaces will face each other. We will sew only here, and we'll do that on the other end as well. Okay, remember that we had a piece that was curved, so you, this may be a little slightly off. Don't worry about that. This is the edge you need to be concerned about. So we're going to sew a half inch from that edge and do some reversing. I've got my cording foot installed. You can use a cording foot. I'll probably change it out to the standard foot a little bit later on. If you're sewing cushions with piping, sometimes I just sew the entire cushion on with the cording foot left in place. When we get to the bottom, I'll do some reversing. But the standard foot actually does feed regular fabrics better than the cording foot. Now I changed the foot out because uh, I didn't like the way the cording foot was feeding this fabric. I'm going to put a top stitch in this. Um, you don't have to. Um, you could put the top stitch here and have the tail fold over to that side, but then the water might get caught here and actually cause dirt and so forth to get caught in it. I like to put the top stitch on the top plate here so that this creates kind of like a shingle effect because this is going to be the side of the cushion so water will run off nicely. So the tail, half inch tail, is going to be folded to the over the plate side to the left. And then I'm going to put a 
uh, top stitch at wherever I want just to make sure I sew into that half inch tail. I'm going to do it right about there. I'm going to splay the fabric apart left and right and keep my stitch nice and straight because everybody's going to see this stitch. This also creates a very strong seam. Now I didn't do any reversing mainly because things are going to be sewn together uh, and stapled to the backer board so I don't have to worry about that. So there's the beautiful semi flat felled seam. Okay it's important to sew this on the right side. There's the top of this panel so we know this is the top here. So now I can move that out of the way and follow the same procedure. This is the edge that needs to be lined up right at the corner and then this edge all the way down. Now I have to start sewing from the bottom here. Not a big deal. Or I could sew with this on upside down. I might as well just sew with it upside down. <clears throat> that way I, I'm starting at the important edge. We'll sew down this length and put a top stitch in the top plate, just like we did on the other side. We'll not be showing that. Next, we're going to join this panel with this panel, but first we need to find the center of this. So we're going to fold this in half on top of our seams, like that, which is the very center. We'll not pull it, it's a four-way stretch, so be careful about pulling the fabric. Seams are lined up. I will crease the fabric at this location and I will cut a little triangle out of it. Okay, so that's the center of this one. So we need to find the center of this, but I have one edge that's straighter than the other, which is this edge. It's actually the foam's cut almost flush with the edge of the vinyl. This is extra long, so we have extra long of material, but we still want to find the center. So I'm going to put the vinyl together and I'm going to even though this isn't totally centered, I want to go on one of these uh, channel um, pleats. So this is approximately the center location. We're going to create a triangle there. And this is probably going to be cut off, but I'm going to create a triangle here. So I have the centers on both sides. Now notice that I cut the foam and it didn't really cut the vinyl much. So I'm just going to cut a little triangle on the vinyl. That way you can see it. Now I know that's the center. So there's my center for this. I'm going to put it over the center of that. Then I'm going to flip this so outside surfaces are facing each other. Now if this were a pattern project we'd start sewing this way and then we'd come back and we'd start sewing this way so it matches perfectly the center. In this situation I'm just going to walk it up here and say okay here's where I'm going to start sewing. That's a, a center centered enough. So we'll start sewing here all the way down. Now See, so that, see some of my stitches are pretty deep into here. I could sew a half inch, but I might miss a stitch. So I'm going to actually sew three quarter of an inch here. Okay, so here's where we'll start sewing. And I'm going to line the fabric up to three quarter inch on the needle plate right there. And we'll just sew down the length, matching up the edges. Sewing through a half inch sew foam can be challenging for some sewing machines, but if you have a sewing machine with a walking foot, like the Sayrite Fabricator or a Sayrite Ultravide sewing machine, you should have no problem. The next step is optional, sewing a top stitch to create a semi flat felled seam. You could skip this, but we think it looks best. Now we could splay the fabric out and tuck this tail to the underside here, but that's super bulky. And also a top stitch in the channeling looks sucky. So we're going to splay the tail out this direction to the left again. And I'm going to put a top stitch in it. Now do you have to put a top stitch in it? No, you don't have to. I just think it looks better. This is very bulky. Okay, so your fabric is more than likely not going to want to feed well. So you're going to have to help it kind of feed. Don't expect the sewing machine to pull this all in. I'm going to put this all in my lap so that I can feed from my lap. 
So I'm going to splay this apart as I'm sowing and help it feed. You can easily help a walking foot sewing machine sew bulky fabrics like this. Just try to be consistent with how the sewing machine is feeding. I'm going to stop with my needle buried, pull on the fabric, and continue. Now there's a little bit of a bump here, so I'm going to make sure that I go slow here, so I go over it. Once this is done, we're going to take the bolster piece of vinyl and add a fabric pole, or what sometimes people call a stretcher. Okay, we're cutting a fabric pole, and it is four inches wide for our situation. Why is it four inches wide? Well, our thinnest foam is three inches wide. So we want a half inch for seam allowance, and we want a half inch for the staple area. So this will provide for a great fabric pole. I'm also going to put a half inch line at the bottom on both sides to indicate where our staples will be stapled into the fabric, which will make our job easier when it comes time to staple this to the board. This fabric pole can be made from any sturdy scrap fabric. We're using Top Notch 9. So this is the edge where the maroon strip is placed. So we're going to turn this this direction. So now it's facing me where this maroon strip would be sewn. We want to take this fabric pole. It has lines on both sides, a half inch for our stapling. And we want to line it up so it's facing in towards the middle of this panel. And we want to sew it as close to this edge as possible. We're going to sew right along this edge. Okay, so we're going to put this close to the edge. And we are going to sew a quarter inch uh, from this edge. We don't want this stitch to show up. And this is just basically a tacking stitch to hold it in place. So we'll start here. Do a little bit of reversing. And sew down our length in that regard. So we're getting close to the end here. I'm just going to sew all the way to the end and then I'll cut off the excess because this is a little bit longer than we, we need. Okay, to cut the excess off, we'll just do this. Make sure we don't cut our vinyl, just the fabric pull. There we go. It's getting exciting. It's time to join those panels together. We want to make this four inches. We need a half inch for seam allowance. We're only going to do a half inch here because this stitch goes over in past the uh, edge and we're also going to be cutting this edge off. So I need to mark it at four and a half inches. So I'm going to use my clear acrylic ruler and just uh, mark it at four and a half all the way down its length. So now we just chop off the excess right along the lines that we struck on the material. Okay, before we cut this all off here, I'm gonna, there's my center point. So I'm gonna mark this uh, as my center. It doesn't mark very well, so I'm gonna cut the triangle like I did before. It's a little notch, I'll be able to tell. The excess material at the end, we place some awls. This shrinks up when you sew it. So what I want to do is I want to stretch it. And that's one of the reasons we have excess fabric here. Now, how much stretch do I need? I don't really know. I'm going to guess approximately there. And uh, we'll see if it's lining up with this fabric. So what we want is this piping to be almost in line with this stitch line here. Um, I put a mark over here, but you can tell by the channeling there. So what I'll do is I'll just put this uh, in approximately the right spot. And I can also put an awl in this. This is a spot that's not going to be visible here. Now I'll go to the other end. So I'm not pulling on this hardly at all. All I did is work out the wrinkles. And you can see that the piping is not coming in line. So I need to stretch this more. Let's try it there. So 
So now it's stretched enough that it's almost perfect. So the best thing to do here is to actually apply double-sided tape to this and pre-baste it before you sew. That's what we're going to do now. So this is quarter basting tape for canvas. And I know you may say, well, this is not canvas, this is vinyl. But the quarter inch basting tape for canvas sticks exceptionally well to the vinyl. So that's why I like using it. And the quarter inch means that when we sew a half inch outside, this tape won't show up when the panel is pulled right side out. If it were wider, you'd have a chance of possibly sewing through it and seeing the glue. So this is the top portion of our seat back and its surface will lay so it's like this. And this edge will get basted to here. We're going to peel off the transfer paper revealing the glue. We're going to start basting with this piping in line with this seam. And then hopefully the, the uh, piping, since we stretched this well on the table and picked it, will be the same on the opposite side. That looks good there. And then we'll just start basting without applying too much pressure. We don't want to pull anything until we know whether or not it's going to match or not, because we can shrink or pull if we need to. So where are we ending up here? So you notice here that the piping goes outside this seam here. So what we're going to do is we're going to shrink this up. We're going to peel it up. That's the beauty of this double-sided tape. About two foot or so. And now, since we need to shrink it up, I'm going to create very small wrinkles in this assembly as I'm basting it. So I'm, if I were too um, short, then I would pull on this. But uh, here I'm a little bit too long. So these very small wrinkles should make my difference and they won't be noticeable in the end results. Yep, we're perfect now. So now I'm just going to push those down because they're distributed evenly along the length and we're good to go. Now I'm going to staple along this edge about every six inches just to keep it in place. So now we'll release the awls because we need the fabric to relax. If I grab this fabric and kind of pull it this direction, that'll give me some more fabric so that I can base this down in place and then staple it. There we go. Now, this is going to want to release, so I'm going to staple it well. I'm also pressing down on those channels so that they uh, don't show up much when we sew, and I'll staple right in those as well. Put one more staple in here. Okay, now we'll do that to the other side. Okay, so I'm laying this piping here at the end flat and uh, basting it well there. I'm lifting the presser foot up and getting it right on the edge of that piping. Okay, we want to sew two inches, I'm sorry, a half inch inside that edge. So I'm laying it up with a needle plate, half inch marks. Now I'll lower my foot. Now this is a big bump, so I'm going to have to help it through. But I want to do a little bit of reversing. So a little bit into the piping. That's quite acceptable. And when I get past this bump, I'm going to be okay. But I first got to kind of push the fabric through because the back of the presser foot is getting stuck on it. Still stuck on it. So I'm going to lift my needle. 
I mean, out of the fabric, lift my presser foot and kind of help it through like that. Lots of bulk there. Still stuck. Now I'm not. Okay, we're coming up to this piping. So I'm gonna lay it nice and flat too. Flat as it can go. And sew through it. Now this tail, we want to be down because we're gonna be sewing through this tail at the half inch location. So we're gonna be sewing right through there. I'm sorry, it's not a tail, it's a fabric pull. I'm still helping the fabric over, I'm still helping the fabric through the machine because it's a big bump. Now I'm past the bump. Now this should be pretty easy. I'm still gonna help. And I'm gonna keep that stitch a half inch from the edge. Everything is basted and stapled, so it shouldn't come apart on you. Okay, we're getting close to the next bulky section. It's really the same procedure. Just lay everything nice and flat. Now see, we, we, we're starting to come unbasted here, but we can just pull the fabric back and uh, we can baste it while we're sewing that section. Okay. See how I created a little fold there? We're not gonna, I'm gonna stop at the piping, but that's how we want it to sit. Okay, I'm into the piping. I'm gonna do some reversing right on top of that piping. There we go. There is no reason to leave all this excess piping just hanging on the inside. Okay, we just need to pull out the staples. Don't forget to do that. This is the back, this is the side, and this is the front. We have extra material in here, we intended for that, and we're gonna start cutting it. We don't wanna cut any of the vinyl, just this extra material off. And right now I'm gonna cut it a little bit long. So that's definitely long. We'll do that on the other side as well. We're gonna turn this wrong side out. And now the final stage is this stitch here. So we're gonna lay it on the tabletop and hopefully it's pretty accurate here. So the fabric comes down and then it gets sewn down to this point with these edges lined up. So with this fabric lined up down here, we know basically how much extra fabric there is here. So we can cut this so that we can just follow that edge, cut the excess off. Now we find that applying seam stick here along this edge can help you uh, determine if it's uh, placed right because you can get a wrinkle up there pretty easily if you're not careful. So now what I'll do is I'll peel off the tape and we will turn this wrong side out. So this is folded back already as you can see here. So I'm gonna basically create a little tuck in that. I'm gonna run this down, and then I'm gonna make sure that my there's no pucker in this bottom fabric as I baste it. Let's see that one more time on the opposite side. 
So we're going to put basting tape on this edge. Peel off the paper and then we're going to baste. So this piping is coming down. This should have a little fold in it like it does because it has a fold here. So we fold this back and we want to make sure that we have no bubble in this. So we want to pull on this panel a little bit as we're basting like that. Now, what you need to look at is on the back side, do you see any bubbles? You shouldn't. So we'll sew from here down to here. Okay, since we have everything basted, I can sew up to my sewing point. That wouldn't be possible if it weren't basted. You would want to sew from your point that is already sewing. But we know where everything is going to land this way. Now here I'm getting to the bulk and I'm going to sew right up next to that piping. We are sewing right beside the piping where the previous stitches secured the piping, so directly over those stitches. And I'm helping it through the machine since there's a lot of bulk there. And then I'll just do some reversing in the flange. Because nobody's going to see that flange. What I mean by flange is the seam allowance area. I reversed in that because nobody will see that. Now I'll do the same thing to the other end. Okay, so here we can start where we started sewing because uh, we can sew in that direction. So I'm sewing right next to the piping. Do a little bit of reversing. Over top of the stitch that secured the piping to that boxing. Everything again is basted in place so we don't have to worry about that. All right, everything is sewn after this is done. It's time to apply the vinyl over top of the foam in the frame. But first we need to staple the fabric pole in place. Silk film will do two things for us. One, it prevents uh, some of the water from getting into the foam. And two, it makes it easier to uh, pull the cover over top of the sticky foam. The silk film actually uh, unfolds. It's folded in half to 54 inches. But here I'm gonna use it doubled over the top of this foam. Okay, so I just put it some packing tape back here. This is the back side of our cushion. Nobody's going to feel that. That'll keep the silk film in place. Then we can also put some along the forward edge as well to keep it in place. Okay, we measured and we marked the center of the, of the uh, board here. Here's where the piping is sewn together. I'm folding in half to find the center of my fabric pole. So I'm holding those piping ends together and then we pull the fabric and this should be the center right here. So when I open this up, right across from that is the center of uh, the fabric pole. So I'm going to put a little triangle there. Okay, now we're going to staple on our fabric pole, which will give it a contoured look. Now we have to do this correctly. So this is my maroon with channeling. So it, the fabric pole is going to be stapled like this, right along the edge of that foam. So if you think about it, because you got to think this through, this needs to go back and around the top, and then you would have, obviously, this being the front. So we have it positioned exactly how we need it. Now we just need to staple it along this edge onto our board. So there's the center of my fabric pole. There's the center of the board. So we're going to put that right at the center. And we are going to staple it as close to the foam as we can on top of that line. And at first I'm just going to put in a few staples just to get it in the preliminary spot. Then we'll put staples about every inch and a half apart. 
The Sayrite upholstery staple gun is loaded with 3 8 inch leg stainless steel staples and their crown is a half inch. The half inch crown means that it will not easily puncture or cut through vinyl fabrics. So now that we have it all stapled in the general spot, I'm going to put staples about one and a half inches apart from each other. This staple gun designed by Sayrite was specifically designed to not drive the staple too deeply into the fabric assembly. It's a great staple gun at a reasonable price. Okay, once the uh, fabric pole is stapled in place, we can wrap it around the top. Once you get one end on, then work on the other end. Don't get it all the way in, in place until you get it on both ends. This end will be a little bit harder because we're going to have to pull a little bit. We expect it for a tight fit. Notice here, as the vinyl is being uh, fitted over top of the uh, top bolster, that the fabric pole is already doing its job. It's pulling the vinyl fabric into the contoured shape of that round bolster foam. So now I'm coming back over here and adjusting on this side. We want to keep adjusting on from side to side until you get the ed ends looking good. Now we're going to wrap this foam that goes here in the silk film. Now notice here that we glued sections together. This is quite common. If your foam is a little short or if you make a mistake, uh, we wanted a little bit more uh, length in this foam. And notice how the ends aren't perfect here. This is all going to compress because it's going to be up into here. So don't worry about that kind of thing. These seams will not be felt. Now the silk film is folded in half as we talked about before. It's center folded. We're going to unfold the silk film here because our foam is too big for it. So it's going to be 54 inches wide, one wrap around it. Okay, so once you get it unfolded, just start wrapping it around with some overlap. And on the bottom side, we're going to tape it because nobody again is going to feel the bottom side of the cushion. At the ends, we'll just fold it over and tape it so it stays in the... Uh... Okay, I put it down and you might want to actually lift this skirt up a little bit. Tape side goes down, so you don't feel it. Silk side up. Do not expect this foam to fit perfectly in there. In fact, the only thing that really compresses it and keeps it in place is the vinyl. So don't think that you're gonna be able to shove it all the way in there. It's the vinyl that will actually do that job. Now the skirt can come down. Right now our vinyl is loosely fitted over the foam and frame. In the next step, we're going to staple it to the bottom of the frame and this will tighten it up nicely. Now that we have the cover on, remember there's a fabric pole here, so this is basically adjusted except for the, at the back, we can pull it down. But we want this maroon stripe to be straight. So we're gonna start stapling approximately at the center location and then work our way out. But notice here, when I pull on the vinyl here, all of a sudden everything straightens out. Um, if I pull too much, then this side is down. Um, so I want to be able to, to uh, staple it and sight the vinyl here, the maroon stripe, to make sure that I'm not pulling more in one spot or less than another spot. I want it nice and straight. I usually start at the center position, but the way that this is bubbled on the both ends, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to start here to get this smoothed out here and put a few staples here. Now remember, we have three inch foam here, so I can't staple right here. I need to staple into the board, which is down here. So I'm going to grab it with my hands like this, so I'm pulling across the width of my hand, not like a finger, because if I do a finger, it just tensions it really hard here. So I'm going to grab it like this, that gives me some consistent tension, 
or if I, if I do this with four fingers like this, that'll do the, basically the same thing. When initially stapling and applying a lot of pressure to the vinyl as we are here, it's a good idea to not just staple it once, but to actually staple it two to three to sometimes four times at that location. So this will cause it not to easily pull through the vinyl. If you'd only stapled it once, then that staple would likely pull through where it's tensioned hard. These are preliminary staples, just getting the vinyl in position so that my maroon stripe is nice and straight. That's why I'm checking to make sure that it's straight as I apply tension and staple approximately every foot apart with two staples at a time. So we have it in the general location where we like it from here to here. We're going to try to pull down here and put a few staples in the middle here. We obviously don't have staples everywhere. That's why you see basically ridges like this. Those ridges will be worked out when we put the staples at the center location. So right now this is what it looks like. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply some pressure here trying to work this down as much as I can. It may not be perfect, but we're going to try to make it as good as possible. There we go. In the middle. I borrowed my cameraman so that he can apply tension as I staple. So I'm not going to staple here, but I am going to staple everywhere in between here trying to work out any of these bumps because I pulled tight here, tight here, tight here. So I want to pull consistently here so that I've got a nice smooth transition and install staples along the length, stopping about a, a six to eight inches from the corners. We don't want to be too close to the corners because we still need to decide how we're going to finish the corners. If we staple close to that, we won't be able to finish it appropriately. Okay, we're going to staple up to this edge a little bit. This is the bottom of the backrest. No one's going to see it. Right about there, the foam member is three inches, so there's where my last board is. Then what I'm going to do is, this corner can be done in a variety of ways. What we've decided to do, it, this is the bottom edge, nobody's going to see it. This is actually hidden completely, in fact the whole side is hidden. I'm going to fold the fabric back, and I'm going to put this right on the edge like that, not applying too much tension, because I really want this corner to not be compressed all, uh, down too much here. So, uh, very light tension here. Now that the vinyl's in the primary position, I don't necessarily have to use my whole hand to draw the vinyl tight and staple it. So you'll often see me now using my uh, finger and thumb to pull the vinyl snugly in position and then staple. To make sure this stays, I'm going to look for my board. We're going to be cutting away this excess fabric. Okay, we're going to start at this at the center here and apply pressure. The face of the backrest is now facing the tabletop, so this is the back portion of the vinyl. Feels good. Okay, we're just going to add staples uh, pulling consistently at spots so they're about an inch or less apart. Now let's work on this back corner. Now this seam didn't fall exactly on this corner and that's no big deal. This is again something that nobody's going to see. So I think again for this corner what I'm going to do is just fold the fabric so that it's uh, like this one down here and give it a few staples. Now we we'll just start cutting away some of this excess fabric. Okay, so you notice that we have some vent holes here. This just goes up into the middle of the board to allow, if the foam gets wet, it allows a little bit of breathability. So I have no silk film over those. Got a few inconsistencies or wrinkles? We're going to show you how to remove them with steam. Okay, we have a few little wrinkles here and sometimes a steamer can help to take those out. So notice where they are now. Let's see if this helps. In some situations, and not in all situations, but in this type of situation, these types of inconsistencies or wrinkles can be worked out with hot steam like this. You can use a heat gun 
or a blow dryer, but you have to be careful not to uh, melt the vinyl fabric. If you use a garment steamer or steamer like this, the use of the high temperature steam will typically not cause damage to the vinyl fabric. So I like to use this if possible. If you don't have that and only have a heat gun or a hair dryer, you can use that, but be careful not to melt the vinyl. You may want to practice with some scrap before you do it on your original. So here's what it looked like before, and you can see there's a huge difference in what it looks like now. So here it is after uh, doing some steam on it, and it's definitely improved it. So anywhere you see spots that have a little bit of wrinkles, it, using a heat gun can sometimes damage the uh, vinyl fabric, but a steamer will hardly ever cause damage to the vinyl. And you can see that those wrinkles are pretty much gone. The backrest of this pontoon bench seat is now complete. Don't go away, the full materials list and the quantities of materials that we used for this single backrest are coming up. Don't go away, the materials list and the tools list is coming up next. It is only through your loyal support that these free videos are made available. Thanks for your loyal support. And be sure to subscribe to the Sarat YouTube channel. Click the bell to be notified of new videos when they become available. Thanks. Here is a list of the materials and the tools that we used. And also, shown in yellow, is the amount of materials that we used for each one of the backrests. The pontoon boat that we're reupholstering requires four of these backrests. You'll find a large selection of marine quality vinyls at the Sarite website. We used Eversoft. We have separate tutorial videos showing how to make the base, the side arms, and the seat cushion. If you'd like to see them, click on a link here. And as always, it's only through your loyal patronage to Sayerite that makes these free videos available. Thanks for your loyal support. I'm Eric Grant, and from all of us here at Sayerite, thanks for watching.